Hey, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to our event with the Mayor Brown on the regulatory considerations for insure tech startups looking to enter the US. Uh, thank you for being here. All right, so today we, we have uh, two, two fantastic lawyers from Mayor Brown who are going to walk us through the kind of things we need to think about as, as we look to expand into the US. Uh, and as part of IIA, I'm delighted that we're doing this event as one of the core objectives for us is to figure out how to help our members expand overseas. And getting regulatory thinking right is, is a key part of getting US entry right. So I think this is a great opportunity for all our members to meet with people who are deep into the US ecosystem and learn and ask questions. A couple of housekeeping things. You already, you all of you already know Airmeet, I'm sure. Uh, but please ask your questions in the in the Q&A box or the chat box. Uh, we will we will wait till the presentation is over before sort of asking those questions and addressing those questions. But feel free to add them as as they come to you. Uh, they won't interrupt the flow. Uh, and actually, with that, I think I'd, I'd hand hand over to Vikram and Sanjeev, our partners at Mayor Brown. Uh, for those you know, they will tell you more about Mayor Brown and their own roles. But uh, Mayor Brown maintains a fantastic public repository of all InsureTech work and InsureTech know-how that you need to know. Uh, and I'm sure they'll share the link as well. We'll share it after the event. But it's a great resource which I've used uh, already in the past. Uh, so with that, let me hand over the stage to Sanjeev and uh, Vikram to take us through their presentation. Thank you. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, can, can everyone hear us okay? Yes, great. Uh, well, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you so much for for having us on. Um, it, um, I, my, my name is Vikram Sidhu. I'm a partner at the law firm of Mayor Brown, where I focus my practice on insurance, regulatory, and transactional work. And uh, just, a, just a quick uh, thought for me. You know, uh, the, the reason we reached out to your association is because we, Sanjeev and I, and our whole firm does a lot of work for innovators, investors, and, and other um, players in the insurance space from around the world, especially in InsurTech as they come to the US. And we help people from U UK, Europe, uh, Israel, et cetera, et cetera, uh, um, enter the US and then build out their businesses in the US. And I, I recall just one day thinking, why are we not doing enough with India? Because certainly I, I was born and raised there uh, and Sanjeev uh, has connections to India as well. And so this is why we wanted to uh, come in front of you and uh, we're very excited to be here. Let me turn it over to Sanjeev for just a moment to introduce himself as well. Sure. Thank you very much, Vikram. So um, I'm a partner with Vikram at Mayor Brown. Um, I focus exclusively on the regulatory side of um, insurance regulation. So that's, that is to say, I work primarily, actually exclusively with how uh, regulated entities can enter and comply with the legal framework that stretches across the US. We're going to go a little bit more today into what that framework actually looks like and key considerations that persons and entities seeking to enter into and operate under such framework need to keep in mind. Um, but as Vikram said, you know, I, I also spent a good chunk of my childhood in India, and we were trying to think of ways in which that we could reach back out to India, considering the worldwide reach of Mayor Brown as it stands in our group in particular. So with that, Vikram, why don't we go ahead and launch into things? Yeah, it sounds good. Thank you, Sanjeev. And so we have... Uh... We have just a very brief presentation for you. It, uh, as you can imagine, there's a, there's a large, uh, th this is a very large topic, of course, but uh, our goal today is to provide a high level overview to all of you on entering the US at legal and re regulatory considerations. Um, it's really intended as an intro, a very high level one. And for some of you who are maybe perhaps already quite familiar with the US legal issues, it might be a little too basic, but we intended it, it just as an overview so that uh, it can invite further discussions with, uh, part uh, with, with the members of this group, uh, because certainly we would love to be of help in the future. Uh, we've already gone through our, our um, introductions. So just a quick little bit about uh, Mayor Brown. Uh, we are a global law firm. Uh, we're not present in India, but uh, we are present, as you can see, in, in a lot of the world. And part of, one of our leading practices focuses on the insurance industry. Um, 
just I'm going to just uh, pause for a moment. Can folks see that my next page or uh, no? It's for for you. It's frozen, isn't it? Um, hmm. Let me just stop that and come back out. Sorry, bear with me. I um, I'm obviously on the law side as opposed to the tech side. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, so um, on this slide, we just wanted to just note for you just how global a reach we have, but insurance is a key, key sector for us. Um, and, and the fact is that our bread and butter, our main clients tend, still tend to be the world's largest insurance and reinsurance groups. Um, the A through Zs of, of insurance industry we work with, uh, both based in the US as well as uh, globally. But over the past five to 10 years, we've done a lot more work uh, as the, the insure tech industry, a, a part of the industry has taken off, we have been deep into it and helping innovators come to the U.S. as well as our large insurance groups when they're working with uh, insure techs, uh, as well as investors when they look at the insure tech space. Just a few resources here for you. Um, the first website is uh, the, the insure tech website that uh, Shwetank was referring to, where we have um, just a few resources for the whether you're an investor or an insure tech yourself, it, it provides some resources and then just a few additional pages to where you can find more information about what we do in the insurance space. Sanjeev? Sure thing. So today during uh, this presentation, we're going to cover three key topics. First, we're going to give you an overview of the U.S. insurance market itself, its size, just so you can have that in the back of your mind when you're thinking about entering such a market. Um, we're going to give you an intro to the regulatory framework that we were talking about a little bit earlier, and we're going to specifically focus on insurance producers. We'll talk more about what that type of regulated entity is, but just to also keep in the back of your mind, um, under U.S. insurance law, regulated entities are separated into, into certain categories, which have differing layers of regulation. So we're focusing on insurance producers today, and then we're going to go into some of the key business relationships and contracts you should keep in mind. Um, so let's go ahead and get started by looking at the insurance market itself. So the insurance industry, as you can imagine, is massive in the U.S. It's made up of approximately, in terms of size, we're looking at approximately $1.4 trillion um, in terms of premiums written in 2021, which splits almost evenly between 53% for property and casualty insurance and 47% between life and annuity insurance. Property and casualty insurance, when you're thinking about that, should include home, auto, commercial, those sorts of lines of business, whereas life and annuities are more of the life, annuity, accident, and health types of lines of insurance. It's, while it's historically been more of a static market, it's increasingly sophisticated, increasingly robust, and increasingly innovation is a key part of the way in which um, the market has evolved. And so what we see, what we have seen over the past uh, few years, as Sanjeev was saying, is just incredible innovation happening in the U.S. space. Um, and and uh, it, it's gone from being an industry, not uh, well, I mean, I suppose this is a global phenomenon, but it's certainly in the U.S., an industry that was considered to be somewhat dowdy and old fashioned to just in innovating rapidly in the recent past. And uh, what you have are lots of new types of coverages and products being developed, such as parametric coverages, episodic insurance. Uh, for example, for, for, for folks renting their homes for a, a certain period of time or using their own personal cars for a certain amount of time. There are lots of products being developed in response to our growing uh, threats that we're facing in the U.S. and globally on cyber uh, responses to wildfires, etc. And really what we have seen is that every part of the U.S. insurance industry is undergoing a rapid change from certainly from the front end, from solicitation to underwriting to claims administration. Every part of it is being revolutionized at this time. Um, just in terms of, uh, before we go further, uh, I wanted to spend just a moment talking about how we typically help uh, insure techs and, and sort of the path that we typically see. Uh, it certainly is not the only path uh, into the US, but as a general matter, most of the time we have innovators and insure tech businesses when they come to the US, especially if they have developed their businesses outside, uh, there, there are at least a couple of key ways that uh, businesses come to the U.S. One is as an MGA, and and, uh, and Sanjeev will spend a, and I will spend a fair bit of time talking about that uh, piece. And that really big picture means the entity develops an insurance business, comes to the United States, 
and launches it as an insurance intermediary, as an insurance agency, if you will, as an insurance producer, that you are, uh, 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 you're not holding the, business, uh, the risk on your books, but you are doing so on the uh, insurance policy, issuing insurance policies for another insurer, but it's really your product, your business, your way of doing business. Another way, of course, we look at InsurTechs is just purely a tech play, providing tech resources and licensing as well as outsourcing services to uh, insure the insurance industry. And that's certainly another way we see it. Not, not the only paths into the US, but that's what we have been seeing the most of. Um, sorry, bear with me for one second. I realize I'm having a little bit of trouble in presenting. I'm just going to close out and come back on. Apologies again for the, the, the tech uh, issues on my side. Okay, and so, so what we wanted to do is again, uh, in our basics of the insurance regulation, it's important to start with this slide. We usually do when we are talking about uh, the, the US market. And, and what's funny is that usually when I'm typing United States of America, it ends up getting typed up as untied States of America. And that is um, somewhat true in the insurance space because ultimately what you have to keep in mind is even though it's one big market, insurance is regulated by the 50 states plus uh, District of Columbia and the five territories. So it's each of them has their own insurance laws and each of them has their own um, regulators and regulations. You may hear references often as you're interacting with American insurance players to the NAIC, which is the National Association of Insurance Commissioners but it, it is not a regulator by itself. All it is is a coordinator of insurance regulation in the US. Uh, it's an association of all the regulators, the 56 different regulators, and brings them together and they consider issues and potential laws, but ultimately all of the legal and regulatory power still rests with the states. On top of that, or alongside that, there is just a little bit of federal involvement in insurance regulation, um, but not, not very much thus far. But ultimately, uh, of course, all we are talking about are the insurance laws and regulations, but any insurance business in the U.S., if you come to the U.S. And, and, and expand your business here, you're subject to the full range of U.S. state and federal laws, securities laws, tax, employment, etc. And, and, and just, again, part of what we wanted to do was achieve uh, just giving you some of the terminology and lingo that you might hear frequently in the insurance space, the way as you are dealing with insurance uh, counterparts, business, potential business partners, et cetera, in the US. And so a part of our job today, a part of what we wanted to achieve was to just convey to you some of that lingo so that you get familiar with it. And so what we have here is that there are different ways of providing insurance to the US market. Um, what you often hear of uh, is that as the admitted market it really refers to insur insurance provided by insurance companies that are licensed in that particular state where the insurance policy is being issued and that insurance policy is fully regulated by the state regulator and including for many types of policies having to actually submit the fo form of the policy and the premium rates you will charge for that policy to the state regulator and having them review and in many instances approve those before you can issue them. We also have a marketplace for surplus lines policies and that is a marketplace that is for types of risks that are not easy to place on the admitted market. So for example, if, if you have a personal zoo where you keep exotic animals, that's uh, typically hard to place with an admitted player, but that's where you can get a surplus lines coverage. For large commercial insureds, it's a basically open route to insurers and insurance coverages that are not fully regulated by the states. But this space is reserved for um, insurances, again, for either very large players or types of coverages that are not readily available from licensed, fully licensed and fully regulated insurers. A couple of other ways to uh, address the market. For example, if you wanted to provide US coverages, you can do that from outside of the US, but that require, that's called direct procurement, but that requires the insured leaving the United States and coming the, um, outside the US to get to the policy, get the policy from outside. And, uh, you know, uh, if we were having a cocktail event after this, we could talk about what it means in the insure tech world to do direct procurement. What if anything? 
Um, and then there are other exceptions to that as well. Sanjeev? Of course. So as we were discussing a little bit earlier, um, the way in which the regulatory framework in the US operates is it operates at sort of a layered level. So that's to say, different types of regulated entities and different topics get regulated in different ways. Again, today our focus is going to be on insurance producers, but let's cover some of the some of the ways in which um, this regulatory framework manifests. One way in which the regulatory framework manifests is with respect to insurance companies themselves, insurers and reinsurers. They're primarily focused on the key elements of insurance, which is particularly to focus on underwriting. So that's you know the process of examining, accepting and rejecting risks, classifying them in order to determine the way in which premium should be charged. These companies also focus on investments of premiums, the claims process, that is to say the process of investigating and adjusting claims that arise under insurance contracts, and then particularly the space of reinsurance, which is when a receding insurer manages its risk exposure by laying off risk to a reinsurer. That's one sort of silo um, and again, this is, these are the types of entities that's, that are subject to major and very intrusive regulation. Insurance intermediaries, colloquially, colloquially known as insurance producers, are sort of a step below that. They're primarily focused on sales, solicitation, negotiation of insurance, but not actually holding risk on their books. They're really, again, entities that are intermediaries between the insurers and the consumers. And then finally, an area that we're going to cover today is going to be products, which say, what are the types of insurance that actually get covered by regulation? So insurance producers is a bit of a catch-all term to cover a few different species of entities and persons. Insurance agents, for example, are persons who represent insurance companies and go out into the market. Insurance brokers, on the other hand, represent consumers and go looking for carriers in order to request insurance. Claims administrators govern sort of the administration process, again, investigating claims that arise under insurance contracts. Reinsurance, reinsurance intermediaries cover the space between the sale and negotiation of reinsurance uh, treaties or contracts. And MGAs, as Vikram alluded to earlier, are a more specialized category of entities, often um, entities that come closer towards insurance companies in terms of what they, what they do and offering and often focusing on areas where specialized experience is required. For example, the surplus lines area that Vikram was speaking about earlier. We'll come into those a little bit more when we talk about business relationships and contracts. Ranjeev, if I may just jump in just with two quick comments. So one is that uh, on the prior slide, when you saw the, the, the regulation of insurance products and, uh, um, and insurance companies, it, it, it just, this is, this is an obvious point, but I think it's still worth stating that if you are, if you're not an insurance or reinsurance company, but providing them any kind of services, any kind of tech services, et cetera, selling them technology, every aspect of what they do with their business is heavily regulated. So you will indirectly be subject to those insurance laws and regulations. In, in many instances, for example, in the cybersecurity space and so on, um, it's those, those regulations that get pushed down to uh, any party contracting with, with them. And then the second point I wanted to just touch on is MGA, because if you interact with the insurance industry here, especially with insurtechs who are playing in the U.S. market, you hear all the time, I'm, my business is an MGA, I'm an MG, et cetera. That lingo is probably so misused um, because all folks are mean in that, those instances. are They are an insurance producer, an insurance agency, essentially, uh, for, and where, that has been given the authority to write business for an insurance company in the US. Whereas an MGA is such a technical definition and is a highly regulated uh, species of agents that uh, at least in your mind, keep, um, keep that uh, distinction. Of course, we appreciate to, to talk the lingo. You might also keep referring to MGAs when all we mean are insurance agencies. Great. So just to cover the overall level or the overall sort of area of regulation that applies to insurance producers. Licensing is going to be required in every state where a person engages in activities that con that constitute the transaction of insurance. Um, so that is to say, if you are, uh, if you want to do business in the state of Pennsylvania, you need to be licensed there in order to conduct any insurance business. Activity in the state is considered broadly, rather as Vikram was just noting, this isn't just sort of a, oh, someone has walked into the state and is and is speaking to another person. 
It covers electronic and telephonic communications and really any touch points that you have with the jurisdiction in question. And again, any such touch point requires that you get licensed in such jurisdiction. The transaction of insurance is broadly defined to cover sales, solicitation, and negotiation of any insurance business. So to cover insurance producers, we're gonna cover two categories. The first are insurance producers that are individuals. So that's say a natural person who's trying to act as an agent, a broker, et cetera. Such person is going to be regulated primarily by their resident or home state, which is their principal place of residence. And from that state, they can then go outwards in order to expand their license. In order to get licensed in the resident state or anywhere else, Oh, can you guys hear me? Can you guys still hear me? Okay, sorry, just I just make sure. Um, educational requirements apply in order for an individual to get licensed as a producer. They need to pass exams and need to continually uh, retake exams in order to show that they understand their rights and responsibilities and the requirements under the law. This, these responsibilities and requirements are going to be um, framed by the type of license that they have. Are they a claims administrator primarily focused on adjusting claims, or are they actually an agent or a broker? Is that license um, defined by a line of business? Are they primarily focused in the property and casualty space or the life and annuity space? Further, this is going to be also defined by, um, depending on the state, residency requirements and whether you are a U.S. citizen, citizen of that state, etc. Uh, okay. Thanks. An insurance producer can be both an individual, a natural person, as we just discussed, or an entity. And in the case of an entity, you're going to see a lot of similar requirements. Again, an entity is going to be regulated by its home or resident state in the first instance and be able to expand outside of that jurisdiction to other states, even though its resident state is going to remain its primary regulator. In the case of an entity that's a producer, they're going to hang their hat, so to speak on the license of a designated responsible license producer called a DRLP, who is really responsible for making sure that the entity is continuing to comply with all requirements, et cetera. And to the extent that a producer is looked at by the regulator, they're going to go through that entity to really take a look at the DRLP. As with a person, the requirements and com both from a compliance as well as just general licensure perspective um, of an insurance producer entity are going to vary based off of the type of license that it has, what type of entity is it, what does it actually do, and the line of business in which it operates. Again, property casualty, life and annuity, et cetera. And it just as a point to note, a lot, note that um, aside from the DRLP, employees engaging in insurance business under this entity to an extent can shelter under its license. But again, you have to be very cautious when looking at the transaction of insurance business. There are a number of Oh, Sanjay, if I, so sorry to jump in again on the back on the licensing. So just uh, one question, sort of anticipating what the folks might be thinking. If if you wanted to expand your business into the U.S. and do so as an MGA um, and 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 do it be an insurance producer in the U.S., it's a it's a process that's state by state, right? I mean, as you've seen, uh, as we've exactly. been uh, hitting upon, it can take a good chunky period of time for an entity, uh, especially an entity that doesn't have an individual who's already licensed. Uh, I mean, you can hire someone like that and so on. But if, the, if you've got an individual who has to be licensed and then the entity has to be licensed, it can easily be uh, six months, but usually nine months to 12 months. And so as you're thinking about expanding into the US, it's, it's something that you want to start thinking about sooner rather than later, if that's the path you would want to go down. Exactly. And rather to the point that Vikram said earlier, untied states is a good way to think about this as a concept. While there's going to be a degree of deference that's given by other states um, to the resident state, so let's say um, licensure is achieved in one state, it's not going to be truly a domino effect. State regulators rather jealously guard their own autonomy. So while they will look to the fact that another state has approved a license application, that doesn't mean that they're going to shorten their period or reduce their requirements as a result. So as Vikram stated, you're really looking at a nine to 12 month process because these, these regulators rather jealously guard their own autonomy and want to conduct their own sort of compliance analysis, et cetera, which does lead into ongoing regulatory requirements for insurance producers. At all times, they need to be in compliance with all applicable insurance laws and regulations in each state, which have any number of requirements from advertising on down um, there are explicit license renewals, usually once every one or two years, during which time regulators take 
effectively a deeper dive into the company or the person in question to make sure that compliance is, is going on as opposed to sort of a more general has something come up or hasn't it to check in on appointments for the agent by insurers to check in on rules of compensation and payments. How is the money coming in and out? Is it again, complying with law? Are they keeping appropriate books and records and are those books and records appropriately located? So for example, resident states will generally require that the books and records, or at least a copy of such be located in that state. Is that the case? Are they fulsome, et cetera? Are fiduciary bank accounts being treated appropriately? Are, are the monies being misused or are they being held appropriately? As Vikram noted, from a cybersecurity and data security perspective, have all regulations been complied with? Are, is there any fear that personal information could be at risk? And generally you see other regulations that could be go up and down based on local requirements. So in terms of one of the key issues that we thought it was worth uh, at least raising for you is, uh, of course, a key reason you would come to the U.S. market is to, to make and receive payments to actually get revenue out of this uh, jurisdiction. There are a lot of different types of rules that apply. So it, 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 this is a space and it's, it's hard, so, so we didn't have to even really try to, to cover it in any depth but, uh, here, but just important points to note. For, for if you have insurance customers in the US market, there are, there's a whole range of these so-called rebating and anti-inducement laws and regulations that apply here. It, um, and what, what does that mean? An example can be if you want to sell insurance to a US customer uh, in the US and then you, you uh, also add certain additional services for free for them. Seems reasonable, seems to uh, make sense. Right, um, but that's a space that's heavily regulated, and for for what is perceived to be a free market, this is a space that is very uh, can can lead to lots of regulatory issues based on giving of something for free alongside the sale of insurance that's related to that. Or another example can be just giving of uh, conditioning the buying of insurance on the customer buying something else. Let's say you sell a whole suite of tech services. And you want to then say, well, dear customer, if you buy my tech services, you're also required to buy this insurance coverage from me. Well, again, you're in this world of uh, anti-inducements that can really lead to uh, significant insurance regulatory concerns. There are some exemptions that have been built in from these laws recently for, for basically for a certain value added services, for certain risk uh, mitigation services, but it's a very na narrow exception. And just to quickly add a quick additional point, Vikram, so just on the inducement point particularly, there is a lot of regulation on this point, and regulators are very nervous about some sort of extra inducement being included. So you often see very de minimis thresholds being set in place for such inducements. So you can see something like someone is allowed to give like a $5 or a $10 very minor object along with a purchase of an insurance contract, and that, it, and that would be it under an insurance law. So while that's not that's not meant to cover the entire world. It's an example of just how granular you can get on some of these points as regulators try to protect against inducements. Sorry. No, ab no, no, ab absolutely. Sanjeev, you make a very good point. Just on the, the couple of two uh, bullets we had up above, commission sharing, referral fees, and so on. When we were trying to cover, again, a lot of ground with just two small little bullets there, is that there, there are times when we encounter um, uh, especially innovators, but businesses of all types who having uh, even seen the small little preview that we gave of insurance regulation just a few minutes uh, ago, they say, I'd rather not get caught up in this regulatory framework. I will just not be an insurance producer. I will just not be an insurance company. I will uh, just stay on the tech side, but sell, uh, well, but, but be involved in the process. That can be okay, but that's a path you have to navigate very carefully. Because for example, if you try to set up a relationship where you receive um, uh, a, a certain part of the, the, the commission that is uh, generated from a sale of insurance policies, depending on the state and depending on what exactly it is that you do, that could be very much a regulated activity and receiving and giving of such payments can, um, without the proper licensing and without staying in your lanes, can lead to regulatory repercussions. Um, again, this is a big topic. We just wanted to just hit upon it very at a very high level. Uh, Sanjeev, anything else uh, from your side to add to that? 
Um, so the next little bit what we wanted to cover with you were just some key relationships. Again, sort of thinking about how we uh, see the uh, innovators coming to the U.S. and what what types of relationships that they typically encounter. So certainly a key relationship tends to be with the insurers and reinsurers who will be backing you. Unless, of course, you are you have an insurance and reinsurance company in the U.S. yourself. Um, but but having the, the, the that there's, there's a whole set of contracts and so on that can be involved here. For example, if an insurer is going to engage an insurance producer, there's usually a producer agency agreement, producer uh, administrator agreement, producer uh, a PMA, a manage, a basically a management agreement that gives you the authority to the extent that's negotiated and 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 nailed down in an agreement and subject to insurance laws and regulations that lays out all that you as the insurance producer can do on behalf of the insurance uh, company. Um, if a reinsurer is the one that's backing you, then that can mean that you will need a fronting carrier. A fronting carrier is, is really just a party. That's the insurance company onshore in the US. It's not the one that expects to hold uh, most or perhaps even any of the risk, depending on uh, what, which laws apply to them. But, but they hope to just generate a fee from being the face of your insurance policy in the US and then reinsure everything out to your true reinsurance backer. Um, and, and then of course, a, a major category of account, counterparties and relationships um, for, for a business expansion into the US can involve a whole range of investors, uh, including VC. What we often see, for example, are insurers and reinsurers also that have their own investment arms that they, they can do a, a dual role where they can actually invest capital into your entity to expand, expand into the US, but they can also then be the actual risk bear, bearer that, uh, uh, so they're investing in you, but also being the actual, either the insurance company and or the reinsurance company that takes and keeps the risk on their books. And so I touched upon these types of agreements previously. Again, our goal here was just to give you a high level sense of the different types of agreements and so on that you might hear about as you come to the, the US if you choose to have your uh, re uh, grow out relationships here. But uh, the, this one, the first one, program manage, uh, manager agreement or equivalent, that's the one I touched upon where that's, if you are acting as an insurance producer for an insurance company in the US, they typically have an agreement such as this that lays out the respective authorities and, and controls that the insurance company will have and how the payments will flow, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the reinsurance agreement, there, there are often reinsurance agreements with, between the insurer and the reinsurer. If you're not the reinsurer, if you're not the insurer or reinsurer yourself uh, and you're just an insurance producer, there's still, if it's your business that you're interested in, you can often have still play an important role in helping the, the those relationships and in not necessarily negotiating that reinsurance agreement, but still uh, a lot of the insured techs do play a role in that insurer to reinsurer relationship. Um, as we noted, there are fronting carrier agreements uh, that can be in place. Um, the suite of investor agreements on our website, the insured tech website, there's quite a lot of detailed information there. So we would encourage you to go check that out to get a sense of that. Um, and then of course, any questions we would be able to answer later. But insurance policy documentation, Sanjeev, did you want to just give us just a high level sense of what types there can be if you, depending on which, which uh, type of insurance you write? I mean, it, it, it can, it can vary. Um, so with respect to insurance policy documentation, you're just sort of seeing like, or do you have the underlying policy and what other elements may go on top of it, just depending on what, what you're, what you're focusing on. Um, Vikram, was there anything in prickly you wanted me to focus on, or? So, so the only thing, Sanjeev, I wanted to ask you to mention for the group was that it goes back to one of those prior slides, the differences between admitted and surplus lines, for example. If you have an admitted policy, and that's the path you choose to write, the regulations are so, so detailed as to the look and feel of that policy. What must, what provisions must go? What are the cancellation provisions? Um, uh, uh, for example, just sticking to cancellation, the insurance laws have a lot of detailed requirements for if uh, for if a policy has been um, issued, how can it on what basis can it be canceled? How much notice period must you give? And so all of these, uh, you know, what kind of governing law can it have? All of these things are very very are, are re regulated in such detail that the policy must then reflect and incorporate that. 
And so just, again, looking ahead to how we see uh, and how we get involved with our uh, insure tech clients is that uh, I, I was referring earlier to uh, the, uh, that tried and true path, coming to the U.S., building an insurance producer business and, and, and really building products and, and relationships on that. But as a next step, we often help our uh, insure tech clients and buy insurance companies or establish insurance companies themselves. So that's going full stack, again, uh, just to convey sort of the lingo that we at least have in the U.S. insure tech uh, field, uh, business area, is that it, it typically involves an insure tech then um, adding an insurance company so it can just write on its own paper, uh, or not its own, but its affiliates paper. Um, often we have MGAs set up captive insurers or reinsurers. So, for example, we have lots of MGAs that have set up a captive reinsurer that is their own reinsurer, but they might have an insurance company that wants to take, say, 50% of the risk, but does, wants to then uh, reinsure it out. And the MGA might think, hey, I actually want to put capital, or, or the MGA's investors might think that they want to put their own capital, but set up a, a reinsurer. Uh, let's say in Bermuda or in the Cayman Islands or even in one of the states that's more lightly regulated than a full insurance company or reinsurance company. So that's one, one thing that we get involved in. We also then, of, of course, get involved in when our clients want to sell their businesses or do an IPO. We, we've been working with a lot of insure techs for, for a long enough time where their businesses are mature enough. They have investor interest despite the financial conditions currently. And we're advising um, or rather our team uh, is advising clients on various exit strategies um and then unfortunately uh, you know as uh, given the 56 different regulators it's not inevitable that we have our clients face regulatory inquiries disputes um we, we see just everything all across the board uh, some some regulators here because they know that a lot more is being done on the internet they've hired people who just roam around on the internet looking for different things and, and just sniffing out if there are any issues so that's uh, and we certainly hand uh, hold our clients uh, through that process. So just th that's the end of our presentation, formal presentation. We would certainly be happy to accept uh, any questions. Again, I, I, uh, I go back to what I started with, which is that we had intended this to be just a very high level introduction. Um, <coughs> and, and so it, um, it's certainly we've covered a lot of ground at a very shallow level, uh, but just given the time that we had, that's all we we thought we would be able to do. But happy to answer any questions that the group might have. Um, and so Vikram, once, once you're out, yeah, it looks like we've got a few questions in both the chat and the Q&A function. Um, I'm happy to go in whichever direction you'd like to start. Yeah. Um, so yeah, let's just quickly run through a few of these questions. Um, on the chat function, uh, no, sorry, on the Q&A function, any difference between insurer and carrier? No, it's it's the same between, um, it really just mean, uh, means the same. It's just the same uh, uh, lingo being used differently. Um, right. Sanjeev, you want to take the next one about commercial insurance brokers? Uh, well, uh... I mean, about the uh, the market itself, or I mean, I'm I'm not uh, just to be sure. I'm not quite sure what what the question is being asked here. Um, Vikram, do you have any thought as to? So I just thought one one possible direction that the uh, person asking the question and, and certainly invite uh, uh, Mondi to reach out with anything further that you might have. But my interpretation of the question was just whether they are regulated differently or how they uh, they they manage their businesses in the U.S. And just big big picture, the basics of the regulation are very similar and very comparable. Um, but th there's there's a view that the commercial insurance market is less regulated in the U.S. That's true in a very, very limited way. Ultimately, um, commercial insurance and insurance brokers are regulated in very much the same way. Right. I know. Agreed entirely. I mean, I, as, as Vikram was saying, I think there is a perception that the commercial market is somewhat looser, which is uh, not, not perhaps not the most accurate, accurate viewpoint. Um, yeah. To go further down, um, one big question is how different commercial insurance brokers are in the U.S. as, as pertaining to 
Asian countries, especially in terms of processes. We can answer some questions maybe on the back end with respect to country to country comparisons. Um, certainly the US is a very robust market and it's got a very robust regulatory regime. Um, so there's gonna be some difference when you compare it to other Asian countries, um, or sorry, to Asian countries in general. For example, I know that uh, some folks work through Singapore, which has a very robust regulatory regime, including for brokers, um, whereas other regulators may not quite be so uh, so pronounced. For example, Malaysia is a little bit is a little bit more restrained, and it very and it has a much stronger regional focus, rather obviously. Um, so, when it comes to regulating those particular markets, we're happy to answer those maybe a little bit on the back end after we've had a chance to consult with some of our colleagues. But just as sort of an initial matter, there's some variation. Again, Singapore being one of the stronger regimes in the in in sort of the Asia or Southeast Asian market. Um, but generally you see US, um, US regulatory processes as, as being more robust. Um, and again, just recalling sort of Vikram's thought of an untied state, United States, the regional differences are, are rather strong. So just because you're able to get licensed in one space doesn't slow down or, or require you to have to comply any less with the laws of a different U.S. state, uh, Vikram. That's the way in which I read that question. Did you yeah. have thoughts? I, I just I focused on the first part. We offer software solutions to them. So my my only thought there was if you're focused more on providing back end um, tech and software solutions, what one big point I would say, and I know this is happening for many of the Asian countries as well, but there's a, a very big push from our side, regulatory system to try to just get beyond license entities, in your example, commercial insurance brokers, to see who is providing technology, who's providing data, and try to make those unregulated parties subject to certain insurance laws and regulations. So for example, certainly on data privacy and, 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 and cybersecurity, you, you see a push down happening that insurance companies push down on brokers, that they must comply with various laws and regulations and brokers push them down, including to non-US uh, uh, software providers. The, the reason that happens is because the parties that are regulated in the US, they increasingly have to file affidavits, have to file certifications and so on with their insurance re regulator to say that they are uh, keeping tabs on and essentially being uh, uh, um, uh, looking at their uh, non-US service providers from, a, from our US regulatory perspective. So that's something that I think Depending on who your counterpart is, it's, it can be a big, big issue because then you are suddenly subject, being subjected to various requirements out of the US. Um, what is the difference between FMO and MGA? I have to tell you, this one stumped me. Sanjeev, are you familiar with that FMO terminology? So I think FMO means field marketing organization. So if the one who's, if the individual who's posed the question could correct in the chat if, if I'm not thinking about it. I mean, there's a lot of overlap here. Um, I mean, in terms of just sort of the marketing of products, you often see a lot of FMOs who are particularly licensed to sell health insurance products. Um, but really, there's there's a lot of overlap here, though the emphasis for field marketing organizations is to really go out on the solicitation side. And then, again, you see it utilized very strongly in the health insurance space. Um, you know, there, let me just make sure that this did, okay. Um, you, you, you see it a lot in the health insurance space. Again, it's at least in the US and at least going by uh, you know, state insurance regulatory laws. There's a lot of overlap, effectively synonymous terms in the sense of they're gonna be regulated in a very similar ma manner. But the difference that I've seen is FMOs are usually seen as being, they're the ones going out and marketing. They're pretty much synonymous with independent marketing organizations. And again, you see them used a lot in the health insurance space. And accordingly, they tend to be licensed. Um, you see a lot of FMOs who are licensed in sort of the, all right, they're going to write health insurance products, whereas MGAs are just broader. Um, again, you see them in a lot of specialized areas. And again, are as, as Rickman was talking about, the term MGA can be used in a more elastic way than maybe the regulations would purely allow for it. Um, but again, MGAs themselves conduct the business of um, the sales solicit solicitation negotiation of insurance, um, often in very specialized spaces. And they often, again, um, fall, uh, utilize more powers that you would really see with 
by the book insurance companies themselves. So to be clear, generally very synonymous terms, it's almost more about what they do as opposed to what they are, is the way in which I would break it down. Yeah. Um, so in the next couple of questions, do you provide support services to get licensed in Latin, in Latin America? The short answer is no, um, we don't do that, but we tend to have uh, I mean, we have our offices in certain Latin American jurisdictions, but just that, that's not the service we provide. But we, what we can usually do is help make connections to such service providers, depending on the market. Uh, what are the regulations around SaaS product for distribution and claims? So I will interpret this question along the lines of what I addressed a few minutes ago, which has to do with if you're providing software as a service to a, a regulated ins uh, insurance entity in the U.S., whether it's an insurance company or an insurance producer, you you're not directly regulated around that, but you get uh, uh, but because their use of such products is regulated from especially from a cybersecurity, data privacy, et cetera, all of these requirements um, uh, uh, that you you indirectly will face. Um, um, requirements that come across to you. So for example, one of the requirements that often insurance companies as well as insurance producers in the US will do is they they know that they have to provide certain certifications. They take those and basically um, uh, make the their uh, service providers, including uh, parties providing SaaS products, um, essentially certify to those to them. So so you, can, you essentially end up being indirectly subjected to various requirements. But as long as you otherwise are outside the US um, from an insurance perspective, just purely providing a SaaS product to licensed insurance parties is not, uh, you don't become subject to direct regulation. Um, Agreed with everything you're saying, Vikram. Right. So the next one, if you were to launch a reinsured back protection plan in the US, will it require state level tie ups or can it be one central tie up? So this question, I think, will need a, a further clarification on what's being asked. So the, if, if all if what you're saying is, can you provide reinsurance from sort of a one state level to uh, and, and then you leave everything else to the insurance company that's uh, further down on, on in the and, and, and for, providing further uh, whatever protections are being given, then yes, it can be central in that there's only one link from the uh, uh, seeding company to the reinsurer. Um, but what I will say what we find often is that ultimately, if you are going to be selling any kind of protection plan any, uh, to, to actually you are, or your partner is the one involved in selling it to consumers or commercial buyers at a, at a at an individual level, that that will be regulated. Uh, protection plans, and we also, I'm also interpreting that maybe in, a, in another way to look at it, just specifically protection plans that are regulated. Uh, and, and those, there is a state level regulation. You just can't do that at the at one central level. There's a bit of myth around it, but we would still say at state level, you have to do compliance at the state level. Right, exactly. Um, MGAs, as they can have own our reinsurer uh, arrangements, does it mean they can design own products as well? The, the long and short of it is yes. That's what we see, that if you're an MGA, that you you design the product, you identify the market, you're the, the one leading it, and you get their reinsurer backer, then you can essentially work to, uh, you know, depending on your counterparties, they can give you a lot of leeway to design the product and so on. Um, in that case, you'll still need someone to do the compliance and so on. Um, it, uh, you'll just have to be, uh, um, but, but, but yes, it, it allows you a lot of flexibility to design your own product. If you have the ultimate risk bearer in, in a, that's ready to back you. Right, just, just, sort of, just, just to emphasize a point that Vikram has, has raised and both of us have raised during the presentation, which is just with MGAs, you literally the only piece that you tend to see. MGs can put get pushed to the point where literally the only piece that they're not doing is ultimately bearing the risk. So again, whereas oftentimes you see with insurance agencies and brokers, just purely the act of buying and selling or negotiating the terms of an insurance policy. With MGAs going into stuff like product development and, and design, you see activities that are usually done on the insurance company side. So just to be clear, like for MGAs, 
really the line that you can't see is the ultimate line between bearing risk that lines up with insurance companies. Um, but otherwise, MGAs do almost everything else that, that you see within the line of business, within the, the area of the transaction of the business of insurance. And then the last question I see here is if an insure tech registered overseas is paying claims parametrically white labeled on behalf of an insurer to criteria set by the insurer, are they required to be regulated? So I'll tell you, this is an interesting and intriguing question. The short answer is the payment of claims is included within the definition of you're doing of insurance business that requires a, a, um, a license. What it means to be white labeled uh, and so on and, and how this question is set up that if it's just a technical service, everything, all the communications, everything is being done by the insurer, but it's more of the, the process service that's being provided, the technical service and the insure tech never appears, but for all intents and purposes, it's just a back end uh, um, process support, if you will, the technical support for the insurer to process payments. Then one can say that that uh, shouldn't uh, need licensing, but it is a complicated enough question that can be so specific as to what the insure tech is doing, how it's communicating with whom and so on. So it's hard to give just a, a general answer on that one. Right, really just to emphasize what Vikram just said, like. It's a really a fact-specific question because, as we noted in our presentation, I mean, these laws are being read increasingly more and more broadly, just in try to cat in order to try and catch up with the level of innovation in in this field. So again, these laws are from 60s, 70s, 80s, trying to catch up with today's innovation. So increasingly, particularly around the point of communication, you see these laws being interpreted more and more broadly. So it really is a fact-specific analysis. So I think we've run through all the questions uh, at this point. Uh, uh, you know, it's been a pleasure joining you all. Thank you so much for having us uh, for, for this hour. Vikram and Sanjeev, thank you so much. That was a very informative session. Uh, I think I learned a lot and I think you can see by the questions that there was a lot of in, interest in, uh, you know, questions around this, this topic. So I'm pretty sure you'll see some follow-ups from my members. And again, on behalf of our members, thank you so much for your time. Uh, truly appreciate it. And we look forward to continuing our engagements with Mayor Brown and seeing more Indian insurtechs enter the US. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank you.